Oh, welcome back to it, your Feel Good Breakfast Show, Expresso. We're live here on S3. Thank you very much for choosing to start your Thursday morning with us. Now, the scourge of violence in schools in South Africa is a growing concern. It's a growing cause for concern uh, for many parents and education advocacy groups. Uh, this really does come after a learner was stabbed to death at the Easter River in the Western Cape in 2029. September last year, a pupil from Alexandra Art in Gauteng was killed in a similar fashion and uh, most recently in Jan a deputy principal was gunned down can you imagine that gunned down at the school gate in Tembisa and many similar incidents do go unreported those are just the ones that we get to see because they go viral now while the Department of Education puts the blame squarely on parents and violence in society experts have warned that uh, the bad behavior of teachers unsupervised classrooms use of drugs and alcohol also does contribute to pupils ill conduct at school uh, and but the question is what steps can we take to end this and cultivate a more peaceful learning environment that's why this morning we've called upon uh, a trusted legal legal eagle the legal guidance of our friend and expert in law and you might even confuse her for a supermodel it's Nicole Lawrence to answer the question how can violence in our schools be brought to an end Nicole Lawrence it's so good to see you thanks so much for joining us thank you very much for the invitation this is it's a serious problem right we've seen so much of this disturbing footage that goes around goes incredibly viral of uh, violence in our schools, whether it's amongst learners themselves or whether the learners are taking on teachers or the teachers are taking on the learners. It's, a, it's, a, it's more than a boxing ring. It's a war zone in our schools at the moment. What do you think are some of the causes of this ill discipline and, and, and all of this violence in our schools and specifically from those coming from disenfranchised uh, backgrounds and communities? So there are various reasons for the ill discipline and the violence in schools, mm -hmm. but I think that it stems from social economic factors in mm. communities, especially disadvantaged communities mm. like poverty, like lack of resources, lack of um, access, <laughs> access to support from maybe the, the, the department or even resources like that, I imagine. As well as community guidance for community, for the community members mm. and basically as well as could as as um, gangsterism, that mm. is obviously one big thing that's happening in disadvantaged communities. So um, obviously that does impact how communities handle their day-to-day -day life and yes. the environment that they are stuck in or are trying to get out of. So, and also I've come across mm. in my field working with many children and behavior issues is that the, the violence could be also related to that they are basically just acting out from mm. what they see in their communities mm. and what they experience mm. basically and as well as obviously the lack of actual resources yeah. in the schools themselves yeah. So much pressure and so much frustration. Um, the question that a lot of people often do ask is what rights do educators have to sort of protect themselves and ensure a peaceful learning environment uh, in their schools and, and, and for their students as well? So educators obviously have their constitutional rights. They have, for example, the right to a safe working environment, a right to dignity, a right to not be abused, a right to a defense, mm. basically. And what all schools also have policies in place. Yes. They have codes of conduct, which is supposed to enable learners and teachers to have that safe environment conducive for learning. However, mm. implementation of that is actually key, mm. which is not really happening as great as we would as want we to. would like to see yeah. well, what sort of penalties i mean i know that every school should right in theory have their own sort of uh, policies and code of conduct but what sort of penalties can a student for example or a pupil um sort of you know face for ill discipline for bullying for violence uh, and, and other related issues mm -hmm. so there is disciplinary procedures in within a school yeah. and if the learner is found guilty they could be suspended Mm. They could be expelled from school. Mm. If there's more serious matters, then there's criminal proceedings. They can be convicted of a crime and mm. sentenced to imprisonment, depending on obviously there's age issues, mm. etc. Then there's also victims can take out protection orders. Mm. They can take out harassment orders against the perpetrators. So yeah. yeah. 
So I suppose that all of these don't just exist on paper uh, in the policies and the code of conduct of schools. Uh, they still are criminal uh, acts at the end of the day. And as we know, crime is uh, you know uh, punishable uh, by law. We're going to be back uh, in a moment chatting to Nicole Lawrence. Uh, this is So Now What? Please do weigh in with some of your questions. Maybe engage with us on this topic on our Facebook Expresso Morning Show SABC3. Your thoughts, your opinions, and maybe some of your experiences as well. We'll see you in a bit. It's my feel-good breakfast show. Welcome back to your Feel Good Breakfast Show, Expresso. We are continuing our discussion with lawyer and director Nicole Lawrence as she breaks down the rights that learners have to safety and security in our schools amidst increasing violence across the country. It's a big, big focus, and we've seen so many videos go absolutely viral concerning this and really sparked a lot of conversations in offices, in public transport, everywhere you go. It's alarming and it's really, really scary. Now, we spoke about uh, the rights uh, that teachers do have in order to be able to protect themselves at school. Let's talk about the learners. On the flip side, what rights do learners have in this regard? So likewise, learners also have their constitutional rights. For example, they have a right to a safe learning environment. They also have the right to dignity, the right not to be abused. Mm. So the way they enforce their rights is obviously if there's any issues at school, they will lay a complaint and yeah. disciplinary, disciplinary proceedings will then take its course. Bold. Uh, we've spoken about uh, very specific policies and code of conduct that most schools in theory should have, in fact, all schools should have. But let's talk about the penalties that a teacher can face if uh, they were involved in uh, transgressions uh, against, I guess, yes. uh, a learner in school. What penalties could they face? So educators, if they are found guilty of any misconduct, they, like, they could be suspended, mm. they could be fired. Also, if it's extreme cases, there could be criminal proceedings, there could be charges laid, mm. and if they are convicted of a crime, they could face imprisonment. Yeah. Uh, most parents, uh, uh, certainly in my experience, I know, don't know where to go to in order to start the process of, for example, uh, laying criminal charges. Is it the responsibility of the school? Does it have to always go through the school? So, for example, if your child was, uh, and I'll use the word assaulted, because it is an assault, it's not beaten up, but the way assaulted by a teacher uh, in school, does the parent go to the school, speak to the school principal, or could the parent go straight to the police station, open a case with their child, and have the police rock up. What is the, 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 the process uh, in that regard? So the process is you can go straight to SAPS. Mm. You don't, normally you would report it to the school and the school would have to do the in, internal investigation. But if it's assault, if it's a crime or anything that uh, external body like SAPS, it needs to be, a crime needs to be reported to SAPS. So if it is assault, you don't need to go via the school. You can go mm. directly to SAPS. At a government level, right, and at a legislative uh, level, what steps can be taken um, to really prevent uh, uh, these um, acts of violence uh, that we're seeing in our school? What, 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 what needs to be tightened there? So, in my opinion, I think government does need to address the socioeconomic Mm. issues that are faced by disadvantaged communities. Mm. And another thing is that I think they need to focus more on preventative measures mm. as opposed to being reactive when something happens. For example, I would, I would think it would be best if learners, teachers, as well as the parents get educated mm. about, the, about violence mm. in, in school so that they can also identify amongst peers, amongst teachers in the classroom, can identify identify issues before it escalates to violence that we see today. Mm. And I think that the bottom line is that we all have to be there for one another. Let's go back to the basics. Charity does begin at home and I think that uh, the lesson that we're seeing here is that there are challenges at home that start there and unfortunately teachers um, you know, have to be on the receiving end of such violence. And on the flip side, if t it teachers themselves are going through, you know, some traumatic experiences at home, this manifests in these violent acts that we're seeing in our schools. And the bottom line is we all can play a role in changing what this looks like at our schools. Nicole Lawrence, you have been fantastic. How can people get a hold of you? Uh, they can get on my socials. All the information is there. Email, um, Instagram, Facebook, normal telephone call as well. And do not be confused. When you land on Nicole's social media, you're going to think you've landed on a supermodel's Instagram account. But trust me, she is the go-to girl, our legal eagle. Thank you very much for joining Thank us. Thank you for you're the great. invite.